Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our transfer pricing, cash saving strategies, and the new audit roadmap webinar. My name is Ollie, and I will be introducing KBKG and launching the poll questions today. Today's speaker will be our principal, Alex Martin. Now a little bit about our company. KBKG was established in 1999. We have offices across the U.S., including Illinois, Pennsylvania, Arizona, Ohio, Georgia, New York, Texas, and Pasadena, California, where we are headquartered. We, uh, we provide turnkey tax solutions to CPAs and businesses. Our engineers our tax and tax experts have performed thousands of tax projects, resulting in hundreds of millions of dollars in benefits for our clients. Our team is a diverse mix of tax professionals, attorneys, engineers, and economists uh, from various disciplines. The combination of talent allows us to be the best at what we do and maximize results for our clients. KBKG is a preferred, preferred provider for thousands of CPAs across the country. Now I'm going to introduce our presenter. Alex Martin is principal and transfer pricing practice leader at KBKG. He has 25 years of full-time transfer pricing experience working in Washington, DC, Melbourne, Australia, and Detroit, Michigan over the course of his career. Alex has assisted companies in many industries addressing transfer pricing issues on a US and global basis. KBKG was recently named one of the world's leading transfer pricing consultancies for 2021 through 2022 by International Tax Review. Alex is best known for developing practical solutions for complicated transfer pricing issues, and he has published numerous articles based upon his time-tested transfer pricing strategies. I'll now turn the pre presentation over to our speaker. Thank you so much. Hopefully everyone can, can hear me. Um, thanks for joining uh, wherever you are, if it's morning or evening. I'm, uh, I'm participating in the AICPA uh, Global 400 uh, Tax Accounting, I'm sorry, Accounting Conference. Um, so a uh, little bit of travel here. Hey, look, um, here's what we're going to talk through uh, on with respect to transfer pricing. We're going to talk through how do you assess transfer pricing opportunities and red flags. We're going to talk about a very relevant case, Coca-Cola. We're going to talk about how the IRS and other tax authorities uh, audit transfer pricing. And we're not just going to focus on compliance. We're going to be talking about tax savings for companies that are reviewing transfer pricing. We'll talk a little bit about Biden tax plans and, and global tax developments. And, well, you may have heard about a 15% global minimum tax, but we're going to talk about how that fits into the transfer pricing world. And as we go along, we're going to, I'm going to present 10 transfer pricing takeaways. Uh, just so you've got a, a good handle or, or some bullet points or, or reference documents that you can use on a, a daily basis. The whole idea behind this is to help you identify, assess, and discuss transfer pricing with your colleagues, with your clients um, on a global basis. So with, with that, let me just jump into an example here. All right, so oops, let's go back one. Um, Let's take the, an example of a German manufacturing parent that sells auto parts to a U.S. distribution company. Now, if the German manufacturing parent charges too high a price to their subsidiary, the IRS is going to be unhappy. Why? Well, they're not getting their fair share of tax. If the German manufacturing company charges too low a price, well, the German tax authority is going to have a problem. So, and while we're focusing on how much profit a company has in different jurisdictions, um, this affects how much a company pays in total and from taxes. Um, why? Because that transfer price drives the taxes payable by country. And that also includes, while we're talking goods and services here, um, it doesn't matter royalties, service charges, loans. If there is a company with a cross-border operations, you have a transfer pricing issue. And it's not just, um, and so this can quite often can be the most contentious tax issue uh, because you've got two tax authorities looking at the exact same transaction and questioning whether that company is paying a fair share of tax 
or if transfer pricing is incorrect and leading to um, incorrect uh, uh, not paying their fair share of tax um, by country. So again, let's just, let's do a little deeper dive here. Let's take an example where we've got Starbucks who buys coffee beans off an exchange in, in Switzerland. They sell the coffee beans to a roaster in the Netherlands. And then the coffee roaster in the Netherlands sells, uh, sells roasted coffees to a retail shop in the UK for sale at their stores. Starbucks in the UK also pays royalties back to the US for use of intangibles, like the design, the cups, the kind of coffee drinks they have, because that was developed in the US. It comes down to the question is, well, where should profits be generated? All right, well, bit of a trick question, but one place that Starbucks was not paying tax was in the UK. Well, and effectively, the company paid tax once out of, at that point, uh, a 10 year period. And so a lot of activists got very upset over this because Starbucks was not presumably paying their fair share of tax. So, and Starbucks said, well, the reason we're not paying tax is that we didn't do a good job negotiating our um, rents in London, and that's why there's a loss there. A lot of other people said, well, hold on a minute. Every other coffee shop in the UK pays taxes. We just think you've overpaid for those coffee beans you're purchasing for the Netherlands, or you're charging, you're paying too much of a royalty back to the US. So what did they do? Well, some activists turned um, Starbucks outlets into homeless shelters for the day. Why? Right? Well, again, they weren't paying their fair share of tax. And I'm not really, they were actually called before parliament and question about whether they're, why, weren't, why were they manipulating their accounts to avoid tax? I'm not really aware of another tax issue that can drive some passions, um, especially when you've got a multinational company and you know there's a reputational issue at play here too because not companies not paying their fair share are you know effectively sponging off it to everyone else. So what what's the insight here? Well tax auditors don't like to see subsidiaries of multinational companies incurring losses. Why? Their thought process is, well, I don't know too much about your company, but I do know how much tax you paid. And if you're not paying tax or you're not showing profits, maybe there's a problem with the transfer pricing. So again, what's interesting there is, you know, regardless where you are in the world, if there's a transfer, if there's a subsidiary that's incurring losses, the starting point is maybe there's a problem on the transfer price. We're being overcharged for those product services or, or royalties. All right, well, let's look at the opposite um, position. And you may or may not have heard about this, but um, the US tax, the IRS actually won a major tax court transfer pricing case against Coca Cola covering the years 2007 to 2009. Coca-Cola, as you might expect, has subsidiaries all over the world. They license trademarks, product names, soda flavoring, what have you. The IRS came in and said, you know what? We're looking at your transactions with Brazil, Costa Rica, Egypt, Ireland, Mexico, and we think you're shifting too much profits offshore. And so even though this case took a very, very long time, the U.S. Tax Court released its decision November 2020, and the IRS issued over $9 billion in transfer pricing adjustments. Coke owes $3.2 billion 
as a percentage uh, from 2007 to 2009. And that's not a misprint. It actually involves a 2020 case decision involves a tax results from 2007 to 2009. We're going to go into this a little bit deeper um, shortly. But what's the insight here? Well, tax auditors often argue that subsidiary companies should not earn excessive profits. So we're working on both sides of the border here. On one side, we don't want to see subsidiaries incurring losses if you're in the subsidiary country. If you're with the parent company, you don't want to see companies having large profits offshore because, again, they're, they're, they may not be paying their fair share of tax. All right. Well, so where does this leave you? Well, again, just to be clear, we're talking about multinational companies. So one parent company, one subsidiary or perhaps two sister companies, but we're talking about cross ownership here. So every U.S. company with international operations has a transfer pricing issue. Every international company with U.S. All right, so let's do a little deeper dive on how some companies approach transfer pricing. And let's take we've got a pharmaceutical company, parent company, that's come up with a cure for the common cold. They have a manufacturing facility in France that also makes these products for the European market. All right, so what's the transfer pricing issue in play here? Well, one, we've got ingredients going from the U.S. to France, and then we have royalty payments going from France to the U.S., or the intellectual property, whether it's for the product or manufacturing process, what have you. Now, quite often we'll ask a question when we're starting a project saying, well, how do you set your transfer pricing between the two countries? Well, um, and quite often what you'll hear is that, oh, we use cost plus 10. Okay, where did you get that number? Well, we negotiated that up in the beginning between the two managing directors, and it served us well over the years. And that's true. That may be the case. Um, that being said, um, maybe that cost plus 10% policy maybe should have changed over time because, well, we've got lots of other business conditions that come into play, like like COVID uh, restrictions, like uh, change in the, the market for this this uh, pharmaceutical product. Um, so maybe cost plus 10 works, um, but for a lot of companies, if you stick with one policy, it may not, may, may not reflect business realities over the time. Second is what we'll hear is that, well, we just operate as one orderless business. So in other words, we're looking at, we're the, the CFO, we're, look, we're trying to manufacture the product for as low a price as possible and sell it, in this case, France, for as high a, a price as possible. Well, what's the issue there? Well, regardless um, of where, whether the company runs things as a, a borderless business, which certainly is, is best practice for many companies, tax authorities don't have the same perspective. They're only looking at the prices of products going from one place to another, which drives how much tax you pay in each country. So even though the company itself may not necessarily care where the profits end up, tax authorities have a different perspective in that I may not know much about your company, but I do know how much tax you pay. So sometimes there's that kind of disconnect or not accepting the reality that prices drive how much tax you pay. And there is a big issue when it comes to transfer prices. Well, that can create heartburn, frankly, from one tax authority to another. Third, um, and this perhaps may be more surprising, um, quite often what we'll ask um, it being a project is, well, does anybody's bonus depend on transfer pricing? 
So in other words, what happens sometimes is that, let's say we've got a U.S. plant manufacturer or manager, and they figure out, well, I can get a higher bonus if I charge my sister company a higher price. Well, that works really well from that plant manager's point of view. That leads to more tax being paid in the U.S., so the IRS is unhappy. But on the French side, well, we've got a problem. We've created a transfer pricing potential exposure. Why? Well, if the ingredients are prices are too high, well, France isn't going to be earning a reasonable or arm's length result. So in transfer pricing exposures really may have nothing to do with tax strategies. There may be a lot of other issues in play where even if a company is not trying to employ aggressive tax schemes, it can, it can happen that, well, the transfer pricing can be somewhat of a, a diplomatic issue from time to time. All right, so what happens if the IRS disagrees with transfer pricing? And let me just run you through some numbers here um, based on, let's say, a 25% rate. Now, let's assume that the IRS comes in and says, we think you should have charged an additional $10 million in prices for, for goods or perhaps royalties back to the U.S. Well, this gets expensive really quickly. Let's just assume for a 25% rate. Well, um, $10 million transfer pricing adjustment times a 25% rate is $2.5 million. Plus, there are non-deductible penalties of 20% once you start getting those larger transfer pricing adjustment numbers. So in this case, we get a $3 million payment plus late payment interest, plus you owe U.S. state taxes. And just because the U.S., the IRS has a transfer pricing adjustment, that doesn't mean that the French tax authority has to agree. In fact, they may not agree at all. So as of right now, there's pretty much a, a likely situation where you have double tax. Both tax authorities are pay, charging tax on that $10 million adjustment. So there's no automatic refund. You can't change your, basically the, the change in transfer prices or really rely on um, double tax treaties to get that relief from a double, double tax situation. So again, we're not arguing over meals and entertainment expenses. We're not arguing over depreciation schedules. We just think you've shifted profits offshore by incorrect transfer prices. And again, over time, tax authorities globally have figured out that, hey, this is a great way to raise revenue. All right. so. There are a couple things you can do here that may make, that can help you resolve that. But so let's do a little deeper dive here. Um, if you've come across transfer pricing before, you may have heard of something called transfer pricing documentation. And effectively, it's a way for a company to prepare an explanation of how the company works. Um, an industry analysis explaining what happens at the U.S. versus overseas. Who does the R&D? Who does the marketing? Who does the sales? A financial analysis of the client results and the transactions. And then there's what's called an economic analysis where you're trying to prove that the transfer pricing is correct or they call it arm's length. What's arm's length about? Well, you sh the transfer pricing rules globally, fortunately, um, rely on what's called the arm's length principle. You should be charging the same price as if you were unrelated companies. Sounds great in theory, a little more difficult to apply in practice. 
So what can you draw from here? Well, the IRS asks for these types of reports upon audit, and it's your first and best opportunity to avoid a transfer pricing audit in the first place. It's your opportunity to explain your case and why transfer pricing is correct. So what's the best practice here? Well, since most countries around the world enforce transfer pricing rules, it makes sense to have one report that explains transfer pricing on both sides of the border. And fortunately, just like the arms length, arms length standard, most countries have similar documentation standards on uh, for, for preparing this analysis. Now, even if you haven't come across these reports before, if a transfer pricing report doesn't make sense to you, it's not gonna make sense to an auditor. So if you do have a report in your thicket and if it, if it doesn't have a good explanation of how the business operates, well, maybe there's a, an issue to think about or perhaps they're, they're, the transfer pricing may not be correct. And as I noted up at the top, there are 10 items, but the, these are really the, the main things to, to take away from this. All right, so what kind of information is included in the study? Well, this is one reason um, I've been doing this for, for 25 years now. Um, these are narrations prepared through interviews. Which country de developed the product and how? What kind of cross-border R&D is assisted, uh, is provided? Who bears the risk that a product doesn't go well? Is it the parent company? Is it the subsidiary? Is it one sister company? Is it the other? What kind of process intellectual property is utilized by um, related companies? Well, all of this is really interesting to me um, just because you get to learn how a company operates, how they actually see how their product service technology is better than competitors. And you want to get a hand, that's what you want to explain to an agent from the 30,000 foot view or, or 10,000 meter view. Now what's in, in, while we're talking R&D here, you wanna do the same thing for sales, marketing, finance. What's, what's the value chain here? Which country is driving it? Because that's going to affect where profits should end up within the organization. Um, and you know, for the, the CPAs, it's also a great way to get to know your clients better. Um, one, thing, one thing I think is particularly relevant, especially now, is how was the business affected by COVID? Which company should bear the risk of losses from COVID? And, and so that's a really important issue to get ahead of before an auditor approaches the company. All right, so what happens if you do have transfer pricing, but the IRS doesn't agree? Well, quite often transfer pricing documentation is, is called penalty protection documentation. Why? Well, if you prepare a report by the filing date of the tax return, and the IRS still makes an adjustment, well, they don't assess penalties. So in other words, this isn't a guarantee that the IRS is going to agree with you, but they won't assess penalties um, if there is a, a big dispute over the transfer pricing, the transfer pricing adjustment's not you know, still $10 million. All that being said, hopefully if you have a report, you don't have an adjustment in the first place. So in this case, a $10 million adjustment is only two and a half million in tax, plus interest, plus U.S. state taxes, you still have the likely double tax situation. Now, one question I get all the time is, well, if I prepare a report once, does that address transfer pricing forever and ever? Well, short answer is no. Um, these reports support the answers you disclose on your tax return. Now, if you do the interviews, you write the report, you've got something thorough, 
you don't have to repeat that whole process every year, but you want to update it on an annual basis. So update the financials, update the benchmarking results, and then you've got some good support for what you did in previous years. So I highlight that in yellow because quite often that's misunderstood. Um, these reports need to be updated annually to be considered contemporaneous or penalty protection. All right, so where does that leave us? Um, let me give you a couple more insights that may be um, let me give you a couple more insights. Um, the IRS actually released some frequently asked questions on transfer pricing documentation based on what they've seen. The IRS wants to review these reports, understand what's going on, and move on to another tax audit issue. Why? They don't want to waste their time auditing companies that have their transfer pricing together. They don't want to see checklists. They want a narration. They want you to link facts with the analysis. And, you know, for, for example, they want to understand what business circumstances affected profitability and how. That's really important. Um, and really, the current IRS audit practice is that if you've got your story together on the selection of what's called best method, um, if they usually don't um, challenge what that benchmarking approach is, um, if it's reasonable. All right, so, so effectively, if you're doing a transfer pricing documentation report and it's contemporaneous, you've got a much better chance of the IRS looking at it and moving on. And that's really what you want at the end of the day from these reports. Okay. Um, what do you want to review? Well, I'm a big fan of looking at off-the-shelf material. Why? What is this? I want to look at country-by-country country income statements, current year and the previous three years, so hopefully all, all open tax years. What does that tell me? Well, where are profits ending up by country? And I'm looking at book income numbers. The U.S. tax return, what's important there? Well, that gives you the volume of intercompany transactions by country and if there's any existing U.S. or international TP documentation. That's important as well. So really I want to get a handle on whether the results make sense by country. If I've got losses in one locations and massive profits in another, hey, there may be a problem, but it's a problem that you can get ahead of by perhaps changing your transfer pricing. So really the question is, um, you know, are, are, I think it's also important, are the reports current, reasonable, and address all countries? Um, for the very largest companies, and we're talking about countries, companies with $850 million uh, and more in global revenue, well, they have what's called a, it's a really a required transfer pricing documentation report that covers all countries. Um, are there alternatives? Well, just to clarify, um, if the IRS doesn't make a transfer pricing adjustment, there are no penalties. There's no additional tax due. Um, quite often what we'll recommend for, com for, for companies where it's a fairly new subsidiary or perhaps the volume of intercompany transactions aren't that large, or perhaps you just want to have a handle on which companies um, uh, profit margins for um, when setting up a, a new distributor, for example. Um, sometimes what we'll, we'll suggest is a, a transfer pricing benchmarking study. And it's not the full documentation, but it gives you a handle on what the company does from a global basis. Um, or I'm sorry, in the, the local subsidiary, we're looking for, we benchmark the profitability of broadly similar companies. And that gives us a basis for setting pricing going forward. So in this example, 
let's say we've got a distributor that is reselling products from the UK. Now, are we trying to benchmark against competitors of the company? No, probably not. But we're looking for companies that do broadly similar, have broadly similar activities to the local country, local company, the subsidiary. In this case, for example, we've got a 5% to 8.2% range of results. Normally, I focus on earnings before interest and tax, or operating profit, divided by uh, net sales. This is usually a good way to get your hand, uh, get a handle on what, it's easy to calculate. Um, it's also something that's straightforward to monitor year on year, um, just, just in, uh, in, in general here. All right, well, now, um, when we were talking about transfer pricing in the beginning, um, it clearly impacts where profits and losses accrue within an organization by country. Um, one thing that we find, and it's especially important now, especially when we've, we've got such business disruptions from COVID or companies that are emerging from, from COVID, is that quite often transfer pricing can be an overlooked opportunity or an impediment for companies struggling with, with COVID-19. What does this involve? Well, taking a fresh look at transfer pricing can make a big difference, um, especially if you can make changes to transfer pricing to utilize tax NOLs or net operating losses. Let's talk about why. Well, let's take an example of a German parent company with a U.S. subsidiary reseller. And let's say previously they averaged $70 million in revenue purchasing in euros. But unfortunately, due to a market downturn, not as many people are, are buying cars, for example. Um, revenue drops from $70 million down to, let's say, $65 million. And for this example, let's talk about the parent company income is about $6 million and they're paying at a 30% rate. So right now they're paying about a, a $1.8 million in tax. Um, and again, I'm focusing on earnings before interest and tax as percentage of net sales as a good way to, to monitor what the transfer pricing is. Okay. Well, let's, I'm sorry, before I move forward, what's an IRS agent going to say here? Well, like we were saying before, like the Starbucks example, tax authorities don't like seeing subsidiaries incurring losses. And great question I'm seeing here. Well, isn't there a, the downturn, the factor in uh, driving losses? Yes, perhaps. Um, and perhaps there's another issue in that the company is purchasing in euros. Maybe the foreign exchange issues are, are at play here. Quite often, what tax authorities will approach this as um, is that, well, the parent company has more, more of an ability to make those transfer pricing um, or manage those transfer pricing risks, so therefore, the parent company should change transfer pricing um, rather than have the subsidiary bear that risk. All right. So we're in a situation where uh, the margins don't look so great. All right. Well, what would happen if the parent company reduced the transfer pricing, in this case by $2.5 million, until we get to a break-even point? Well, what does that do? Well, if we reduce the transfer prices to the U.S. by two and a half million dollars, we move to that break-even point, and that means there's less profit or taxable income in Germany. So we we do have a two for one. We're reducing the transfer pricing risk in the U.S. 
and we're paying less tax in Germany. Well, the savings from that, two and a half million by 30%, is $750,000 in cash savings. Good questions here um, that are popping up. Um, one, um, isn't the IRS going to want more than a break-even situation? Short answer is absolutely. They want to see, they would rather see the subsidiary earning at least some profits for their resale equity. That being said, we have reduced the risk there. The second thing that often comes up here is that the German parent company, the German tax auditor, are they going to like what's happening? Well, perhaps not. Um, but that being said, if we're explaining what's happening to the German tax auditor, we're saying, well, obviously the transfer pricing is incorrect because the subsidiary is incurring losses. So what's the argument? Well, look, companies operating at arm's length wouldn't continue to sell in the U.S. market if they were continuing to incur losses. So, again, yes, there has to be some substance here, but we do have the two for one in that we're saving money and reducing audit risk by taking that adjustment on the transfer pricing front. Could this work in situations where we've got manufacturing? Well, short answer again is yes. Quite often, like we were talking about before, a company has a cost plus X percent margin. Well, that leads to large profits in one organization or one company. And let's say due to COVID, the parent company's got a $2 million loss. All right, well, if the manufacturing subsidiary is earning really large profits, $5 million in this case, um, on $10 million of inventory sales. Well, maybe there's room to move where you reduce the transfer pricing by, in this case, $2 million, which reduces the tax NOL in country A and then results in lower taxes in the manufacturing subsidiary company. So that tax savings is $2 million times a 30% tax rate is $600,000. And certainly there needs to be substance there, but by making this adjustment, you're really saving yourself on the tax NOL position perspective. That drives a lot of savings. I'm going back to my uh, favorite um, work topic, which is uh, Coca-Cola. And Coca-Cola wasn't just trying to, they've been fighting this court case for, for quite a while um, on a number of different fronts with a number of different arguments. And where all this started was that Coke and the IRS actually had a closing agreement for an audit back in 1996. And at that point, they apportioned uh, profits by country um, by formula and there wasn't an audit for a long time for two or three audit cycles transfer pricing wasn't brought up as an issue and Coke came to the table and said during this court case and said well look you hadn't audited audited over a 10-year period so transfer pricing must be reasonable um, and the 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 IRS responded that no, just because we had a closing agreement from 1996, transfer pricing rules or tax return, tax audits all stand on their own. So the agreement that they reached way back when doesn't apply on a go-forward basis. And Coca-Cola actually had been applying that uh, 1996 agreement on a, a global basis. Um, what, and, and and but really what the the case turned on was well why should low risk contract suppliers in these subsidiary countries earn excess profits well coca cola still strongly believes that even though they lost a court case at 3 billion dollars in tax they have only 
they only put a reserve on the books, tax reserve, of $400 million. However, they said if the IRS prevails all the way through 2021, they're going to owe $13 billion. So, so, so perhaps that's a, a little surprising, but here's my thought process here. Um, going from left to right, and we're talking about a 2007 to the 2009 case we we're talking about, going from left to right, the 10% return on operating assets is what an average food company earns. The IRS had an economist which figured out what all the, the profits could be. Um, Coke US earns about a, a 53% uh, margin for, um, for, for their activities. And as you go to each country from Coke Mexico all the way up to, to Coke Ireland, you gotta ask the self, yourself a question. Does it make sense that Coke Ireland should earn so much more profit than Coke in the US? And frankly, I find that to be a pretty compelling argument um, when you're talking about what a multinational company should do. How can you detect this type of issue? Well, if you're looking at the profit margins by country in each of the subsidiaries and you're seeing really high profits, maybe there's a transfer pricing problem to deal with. So this case is ongoing. Um, Coke lost, again, on a um, another another um, um, appeal, and yeah, here's 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 what the situation is is now. What I think it, the important thing to take away from this court case is that one, just because you haven't been audited before, well, you still have a, there's still a chance of being audited for transfer pricing especially if you've got profits in perhaps uh, different places. For Coke, um, since the, the IRS is, has won um, some pretty big dollars, I find this to be a good template for them for any other U.S. companies that um, have very profitable companies. And it raises big, big money for them. And Coca-Cola lost its appeal in October 2021. This, one, this decision kind of blew under the radar. But effectively, the judge said, "Well, we think all of your we think all of your arguments are are futile, and although Coke seems to think that they're they're going to win at the end, um, so what's that insight number nine? Coca Cola court case is a template for big tax adjustments. It's a straightforward argument. It's very convincing to a judge, and you know, off you go." Amgen also, um, the pharmaceutical company also has a, a similar issue, um, this time with their uh, uh, Puerto Rican uh, subsidiary plant um, that's underway too. Um, so here's some observations. Look, if you've got subsidiary losses or tax NOLs in a subsidiary company, I have a subsidiary tax risk, or that's their starting point. If you have, and that's the, that's the Starbucks example, if you have large profits in subsidiaries, well, you got a parent company tax risk. And what I strongly suggest is to look at all open tax years when you're doing this. It's not the final answer. You may have very good reasons for having losses or very large profits in certain locations, but you wanna have a good handle on what a tax auditor sees because that's what's gonna be the starting point and you want to be able to explain why things the way they are and why perhaps things aren't um, quite as clear from just looking at some, some books and records from a, a tax return. I also suggest if you monitor transfer pricing during the year. It's a lot easier to make those adjustments if you're looking at results at the six month period, nine month period, and perhaps right before year end. The other thing is, um, you want to look at annual profit margins for each subsidiary. Um, that's what annual book margins are, what's driving the, the issue here. And um, it, that's those annual profit margins are what, or profits or income statement, 
drive what the results are on the tax return. Now, the IRS has that uh, $5 million adjustment before penalties apply. Um, that being said, there are a lot of other countries that have far uh, smaller thresholds, whether it be Mexico, India, um, but it's also, but it's still very important to make sure that the Mexican documentation you have matches up with the U.S. transfer pricing documentation you have. You want to have a consistent tax of, you want to have a consistent argument on all sides of the border. Um, global minimum tax. Well, they're, they're still negotiating this. Um, they're hopeful to have this in place by um, 2023 or, or the beginning of 2024. This may not apply to a lot of companies um, that were on the, the discussion here. Um, it's really the largest com companies would pay at least 15% income tax in every country where they operate. So at least a lot of countries out there that aren't affected by it. Then there are some also some new taxing rights. So think the Amazons of the world where if the company has revenues greater than 20 billion and profits over 10% that, well, they've got to pay, um, they've got to pay tax on the, the sales they have locally. Now, does this global minimum tax resolve transfer pricing issues? And well, frankly, no. Um, transfer pricing audits are still more lucrative than than just doing this 15% rate. So even a successful transfer pricing audit to would lead to 25% taxes on most of those profits, plus interest, plus penalties. So even Coca-Cola, even if they had a 15% tax rate, um, it, it's it's not going to, to solve the issue when it comes to, to transfer pricing. So really, from, from my perspective, the, it's the proposed minimum tax is really a backstop but governments still can generate far more income from transfer pricing audits. So audits are a much higher return on investment, even with a global minimum tax. Look, tax auditors argue that subsidiary co companies should not incur losses. The Starbucks example. Tax auditors often argue that subsidiary companies should not earn excessive profit margins. The Coca-Cola example. So we've got too cold, too hot. We're trying to get to that Goldilocks right in the middle here. Um, the arm's length standard applies in over 100 countries. So pretty much you can count on um, most countries where you have some uh, cross-border transactions, it, 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 there, there may be some transfer pricing uh, requirements in play. Um, and just because there are transfer pricing exposures, that doesn't necessarily mean there's an aggressive tax strategy in play. It could be human nature, or it could be we're just look, we're not we're looking at it from a um, overall overall global basis. Um, if you do have a transfer pricing documentation report, if it doesn't make sense to you, it's not going to make sense to an auditor. An auditor needs to understand how the company works. Tell me what's important in part of the business, and here's why transfer pricing is correct. Um, these reports need to be updated annually to be contemporaneous or penalty protection. And if you do have a contemporaneous report, they're much more likely, the IRS is much more likely to accept your argument as opposed to come up with their own. If you don't have a contemporaneous documentation report, well, the IRS may have some very different arguments they're going to put forward when it comes to an audit. Um, don't always think about transfer pricing as a compliance only perspective. Um, quite often, our, our starting point when we talk with clients is, hey, can you improve transfer pricing or improve your global effective tax rate or help make cash, put cash in the right area that's going to solve things or actually improve how the company uh, operates. Um, Coca-Cola, keep an eye out that for that. There's, I, I expect there's going to be some more news on Coca-Cola um, sometime soon about, again, not paying, having shifting or putting profits too uh, far out of the country. And again, transfer pricing audits are a high return of 
uh, investment, even with a global minimum tax. So just because you hear quite about a bit about it going forward, whether especially if it passes, um, count on transfer pricing audits being the, the right um, something important. Um, with that, um, here's my my details. Um, I'd be more than happy to take your questions, comments, ideas. Um, we'd be grateful to, to hear from you. Um, our focus is on practical solutions here, so and I hope you found uh, this presentation helpful as well.